So this looks very similar. This is basically a textbook from maybe 10, 15 years ago. But actually recently in the last 20 years, a lot of observations have shown that it is not that simple. So actually, if we look at massive stars and if we check what kind of systems there are right after star formation, we find that a lot of them are in binary system. And actually a majority of those are in binary systems where the two stars interact as well. So that means there's not one star, but there's two stars that orbit around each other. And that evolution that happens to stars doesn't happen like there was only one star, but there's a present of a companion. And there's very many, many different types of channels that they can occur in these binary systems. I'm only showing one here where you have a type binary system where the two systems are so close that mass transfer occurs. So one of the stars fills its rush lobe. You can see a little bit the shape depicted there. And a, a, a phase of mass transfer happens where one star transfers mass to the other. It's usually the more massive one because it evolves faster and it will lose almost the entirety of its envelope. And what is left behind is only the core and you can probably still see it up there. While the other star, the secondary gains a lot of mass but also gains angular momentum and probably is spun up. So it, rap it rotates rapidly around its own axis and then Every all the future evolution depends a lot on the mass of these two stars. And this is just one example again. If the primary that was stripped of its envelope is still massive enough, it might explode. It might turn into a neutron star or black hole. It might end up as something like an X-ray binary system that is depicted over there. And then again, with lots of mites and mites, and depending on the configuration of the system, what will eventually happen or could eventually happen is that the system becomes a gravitational wave source if there is two compact objects that are close enough. So that means that this linear evolution that I've shown in the first slide is actually not true. And there's a lot of complications. And again, this is just one channel that could happen, but there's many others that makes all of this evolution very complicated. So why is this so important? Well, because there is a big importance to massive stars. First of all, they're really bright and they're really the sources of ionizing radiation. If we look at a cluster, a galaxy, in their surroundings. Also, I said already, a lot of them will probably explode as a supernova. So first of all, we can observe those to very far distances, but also that means that the chemical material that they produce is put into the interstellar medium and used again for um, subsequent star formation. They provide feedback, as I said, with their supernovae, with their winds, they provide chemical enrichments because they make, the um, elements are formed in their cores that are then distributed to the surroundings. And of course, if we observe a distant galaxy, then what we will observe is the brightest stars, which are the massive ones. So if we observe those, we mostly see massive stars in there. So we, if we want to understand the galaxies, we need to understand the, the building blocks they're made from. And as I just mentioned, since recently, we've been observing quite a lot of gravitational wave um, mergers, which come from massive stars. So again, to understand those, understanding massive stars is important. But let's come back to my title. So my title was about classical BE stars. I've so far told you about B-type stars, which are a subgroup of massive stars. But so what are BE stars? And so to introduce those, I brought you the Pleiades, which probably you've seen. It's a constellation. Of course, these stars are not very much related among themselves, but it's a nice way to demonstrate what BE stars are. Most of the stars in the Pleiades, actually three of the, of the seven ones, are what we call B-type stars. So their spectra are dominated by strong absorption lines. For example, this is eta alpha, a very strong um, hydrogen line the, uh, in the Balmer series. And you see that it's a big absorption line. So if we look at the rest of these stars there, all the ones with the blue circles, and we check their Balmer lines, we see it looks very different actually it shows emission and not, and not absorption. And again, this is just a demonstration because it's a nice constellation in which this occurs, but it occurs for many of the B-type stars. So spectroscopically, it's really the definition is if there is a B star that has emission lines, we call it a BE star. What that physically means is a different question. It doesn't mean that all of the stars that actually show a B-type spectrum and emission are the same thing physically. So there's a lot of things, and I'm just listing a few of them here, that could have such a signature. For example, uh, let's just say the magnetic stars could be B-type stars that show emission because they have a strong magnetic, magnetic field. 
or B-type supergiants have a B-type spectrum, but they have strong winds, so they have emission lines too. The ones I want to focus on are the ones that we call classical BE stars, and there has been a lot of research to show what they actually are. So observations have shown that these kind of stars, um, well, that the pheno phenomenon behind this is transient. So if you look at a star, you might see emission lines. If you look back, let's say 10, 15, 20 years later, emission is gone. If you look back a year later, it might be back there again. And actually, if you count, if you just look at these stars in the galaxy and you count, you find that 20% of them show this phenomenon at some time. So it's actually quite common for massive stars. It also occurs in uh, late O types and early A type stars, because again, spectral typing is a bit, it doesn't really mean that much. Uh, um, well, it does mean something, but it's, it's not linear with mass. And a lot of observations we're using different techniques have shown that the physical nature of these stars is the following. So first of all, those are rapidly rotating. How rapidly is not really clear, but quite rapidly. They are also pulsating. They show non-radial pulsations. And this emission line feature that we see in the spectra comes from a disk. And that is not an accretion disk, but basically the opposite. It's called a decretion disk, in which basically the material is not accreted onto the star, but it moves outwards. And um, basically that leads to the signature that we see in the observed spectra. Depending on from which angle you look at the star and the disk, you get a different signature that leads to these different emission lines, but all of them show emission if there is a disk in the stars. And because they are rapidly rotating, the absorption lines we see from these stars are very broad. So we see broad lines plus these emission components, usually in the Balma series, so in the hydrogen lines, but also, for example, in helium lines and also in some metal lines. Okay, so that's a physical picture we have so far for these classical VE stars. But there's, of course, a lot of open questions. I've said already the phenomenon is transient. So something must happen that leads to the buildup of the disk and then the disk disappears and it comes again and it's not really clear what is the duty cycle, why this is the case and what is actually causing the buildup of, build of the disk. It is also still not very clear how fast they are rotating. So what is usually defined as the critical velocity, which is basically the velocity at which a star would break apart um, and it's not really clear how close to these critical velocities these stars are, probably rather close, maybe 70, 80, 90%, but it's really hard to measure. Then, of course, if a star rotates that rapidly, it becomes deformed. So those are not spherical anymore, but more like um, oblate. And then, of course, the question is, where, why are they rotating so rapidly? So where is this rapid rotation from, uh, coming from? And this is basically what I want to focus on uh, in today's talk. There were mainly mainly two channels, and I've already mentioned binaries before, so that's one of the ideas, that were proposed to explain this rapid rota rotation. The first one, well, if we think back of stellar evolution, we just think of a single star. So how could a single star be a rapid rotator? It could be born like that, or it could have gained this uh, rapid rotation somehow during its evolution. Observations have shown that probably not many stars are born rotating rapidly. So let's focus at the other one, which is the internal ev evolution of a star. So this figure shows the evolution of a star during the main sequence. So at the bottom, there is time. So time goes from left to right and from the beginning to the end of the main sequence. And it shows how fast, unfortunately, this yeah, I'm gonna, nah, it doesn't work. Well, anyways, and for, uh, it shows the rotation of a star. So this one rotates with around 350 kilometers per second. And it also shows the critical velocity of a star, which during the evolution decreases because what, during the main sequence evolution of a star, it increases, it increases in radius. So if we just plot the ratio of these two, the fraction of the rotation of the critical rotation, you can see that towards the end of the main sequence, these stars actually approach the critical velocity because it decreases faster um, than the rotation velocity of the star. So if, let's say, 80% of critical is enough to make a BE star, you would expect that at the end of the main sequence evolution, a single star could appear as a BE star because it approaches the critical velocity. That's a basic idea. So if this would be true, then what would we observe? Well, now this is already tailored a bit to the second idea. I do have a 
Ah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, so you can compare what observational properties these st styles should have. So first of all, what we just said, this is something that would occur at the end of the main sequence evolution, because that's when the stars approach critical. And these stars do this on their own. This is just the internal evolution of a star. So if we look at the binary properties, and I said before, these stars usually 50% of them have a close companion. Well, it should be the same for BE stars because it just matters whatever the star is doing in, in the interior. And they should just behave. They have no peculiar velocity. There should be nothing special about them in that sense. So let's have a look at the binary channel on the contrary. And that's basically what I had on my slide before. One of the possible ways of a binary system to interact is that you have two main sequence stars. The primary evolves faster. It fills its rush lobe. It goes into mass transfer and transfers material to its companion. The companion, during, due to this mass transfer, which also transfers angular momentum, is spun up. So it is a rapid rotator. And the companion, which is here called a helium star, is basically the leftover core of the previous primary that has lost its envelope. So what would we see here? Ah, oh, yeah, sorry. And actually, well, a lot of stars are in binaries. So this seems like it could be a viable channel because we know that there's a lot of these pre-interaction systems. The theoretical predictions for how um, efficient this channel could be actually differ quite a lot. If you look at papers that came out in well, the last 30 years, they said either a minority of BE stars could be formed by this channel, half of them, or all of them depends a lot on what you assume, for example, for the mass transfer efficiency, for the spin up of the stars, and all these things. But if we compare what we would observe if the binary channel was making, let's say, all or majority of the BE stars, then, well, the star that we see as the rapidly rotating one is the mass gainer. So it doesn't depend on that star's evolutionary state, whether it's a BE star or not, because the evolution of the primary dominates the mass transfer. So we should see them at any point during the main sequence evolution because it doesn't depend on their own evolutionary timescale. The second thing is the mass transfer makes these stars. So there should not be any BE plus main sequence systems that are closed because, well, you need the mass transfer and you strip the envelope of the main sequence star, which is then a stripped star, not a main sequence star anymore. And you shouldn't see a main sequence companion next to a BE star unless there's triples or quadruples or more complicated things. And then of course, if that is the case, then you should see a lot of, yeah, let's say exotic, interesting companions to BE stars because you have these interaction. You strip a star and you get a BE star with a companion that is either stripped or if it's already further in its evolution, it could turn into a neutron star or black hole. Or if it explodes, there could be a supernova ex um, explosion and it could turn the BE star into a runaway because this, it, this system is broken apart and the star is basically being kicked away in that um, explosion. So if we compare these observationally, there is quite a difference. And if we look at all these parameters, if we observe a lot of BE stars, then we should actually see a difference. And then we should be able to tell which of the two is the dominating channels. So let's have a look. First of all, where do we see BE stars? Where in the evolution do they occur? And one of the good um, places to look at this is star clusters, because in a star cluster, we can assume all stars are basically born at the same time, all stars are at the same distance. So it gives us a nice environment where we have a starting point and we can look compare the age or the evolutionary stage of, of different stars. I'm just showing one cluster here. I'm going to say already this, we find this in many clusters. I'm just picking one example for which we have nice observations. It's called NGC 330 and it's in, in the small Magellanic cloud. It's around 35 million years. So it's at an age where the B stars have not all already evolved, um, evolved off the main sequence, but there's quite a large number of those still there. And we have observations of this cluster with the HST and also with MUSE. And MUSE is an integral field spectrograph at the VLT. So it's just depicted here how it uses the lasers uh, to do the observation. And this is an RGB image of the cluster observed with MUSE, where we just use the MUSE observations to make a three colored image. Um, so basically, yeah, the same as always, red stars are the cool ones, blue ones are probably the bright blue ones, the blue supergiants. 
and the other one are mainly B-type stars. So what we can do if we combine the two data sets is make a color magnitude diagram, which is basically like a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, but observational, using two different HST filters. And then we can use the integral field spectroscopy to extract spectra for all of the stars, well, all of the brightest ones. You see the cutoff here. And just check, do they show emission lines or do they not? And this is basically shown here. So the red and the blue stars are the red and blue supergiants. The yellow ones are stars that show a B-type spectrum. Um, and all the green ones are the ones that show emission lines. So first of all, there's a lot. And second, you see that there's these faint ones down here. So in a star cluster, the stars that are at the end of the main sequence evolution should be at the cluster turnoff. But we see BE stars very far below the turnoff as well, indicating that those are stars are not toward the, towards the ends of their main sequence evolution. So basically, we can do just taking the y-axis here and making a histogram, just counting how many B stars, how many BE stars are there. So that's the yellow and the green bars over here. And the gray line gives the BE star fraction. So there you can see that above the turnoff, basically 50%, 60% of the stars are BE stars. So in general, there's a lot of them. And the fraction drops quite a bit, but there are still BE stars that are very far, much fainter uh, than the cluster turnoff. So that indicates there are some that are not at the end of the main sequence evolution. So the ones that are at least the ones that are above the cluster turnoff are probably B E stars that were formed in binary interactions. Because again, according to the single star channel, this should only occur at or above the turnoff. And these ones are very far from that. So basically, that's the first argument we have. There are these so-called unevolved B E stars uh, that we see in clusters. Again, not only in NGC 330, but also in different ones that probably point to the fact that those, at least on NGC 330, but also in different ones, that probably point to the fact that those, at least those ones, the faint ones, were produced in binary interactions because they are not at the end of the main sequence evolution. The next thing that we can check is what do we actually see if we look at BE stars and their companions? Do we observe that BE stars have similar binary properties as B-type stars? Or do we find actually that there is a lack of main sequence companions? I'm just mentioning one study here to compare with. So this is a study that looked at B-type stars by Benyard et al. in a galactic cluster, and they measured the binary fraction. And this is only the observed binary fraction. And this is the stars where they detected two main sequence stars, so a B star with a main sequence companion. And there is a lower limit for this, and that's 25%. So now we have the B stars. What about BE stars? Unfortunately, there is no spectroscopic survey that really targeted BE stars and checked for their binary companions so far. So what we did is we went to the literature and we selected a sample of massive BE stars to, well, um, that means spectral type B1.5. So that's roughly stars that, that initially, I think 15 solar masses ish. And it's more or less comparable to a large number of the stars that were uh, studied in the B-type binary study. And we checked if there was any mention in the literature of these BE star having a main sequence companion. Of course, this is a literature study. It's, where is it? Roughly 300 stars. So some of them were very well studied. Some of them barely had a spectral type from the 90s. But actually, if you think about it, these star, the, the main sequence companions would be the easiest to spot because we see them in the optical and for the B-type stars, those are the most usual companions. So we just basically did that. We looked at the literature, and here's what we found. And there's more or less 90% that we call presumably single, which are stars for which there's no mention of any binarity indication in the literature. So that means either they are truly single or they haven't been observed enough to have detected a companion. So we call them presumably single. Then there's 4% for which companions were detected, but it's not really clear what the nature of the companion is. And there is 5% of stars that have what we call non-main sequence companions, which means they're either compact objects or stripped stars. 
And interestingly, there was not a single unambiguous, and I'm saying unambiguous report because there's two or three systems that are debated what the companion is of a main sequence plus PE star. And again, in contrast to the B type star, and given that it's the easiest to observe a main sequence companion next to a BE star, this already gives another indication that the binary channel is important for BE star formation because there's this lack of main sequence companions. And as I just said, there's roughly 10% that have some companions. There's newer studies that actually targeted BE stars using broadband photometry. One of them is by Clement et al. And they just looked at the SED of these stars. So this is now not literature. This is really a study looking at the SED. And they found indications uh, in the SED, basically, that the companion is disrupting. There is, well, there is a companion that is disrupting the outer parts of the disk manifesting in the SED. So basically another um, argument for BE stars having companions that were not detected, so probably at least some of them not main sequence companions. So this is the second argument. Probably a lot of BE stars were formed through the binary channel because there is a lack of close companions, while there are a lot of close main sequence companions for normal B-type star stars. Sorry. Um, so let's look at the companions that were found next to BE stars. Again, if they should be single stars, well, they should behave like normal B-type stars. If they come from the binary channel, there should be stripped stars or compact objects that are companions to BE stars. And there should be some BE stars that were disrupted and are now runaways. So what are the companions to BE stars that we know? I just said there is not an, a single unambiguous report for massive BE stars again. Uh, of a main sequence companion, but we do know a few systems that have stripped star companions. So subdwarf companions, SDO or SDB stars, which are stars that we think were stripped in a previous binary interaction. And using different techniques, I mentioned the optical here, but mainly these stars were detected in the UV because the stripped stars are very hot and compact. So usually they're easier to spot in the UV. And those observations and also using interferometry have shown that there's a handful of systems, maybe 20, uh, where we know there is a BE star and a subdwarf companion. Again, they're much harder to spot than, than the main sequence ones. But if you, for example, use UV observations, then they can be detected. This is figure showing a, a sample of these BE plus subdwarf companions, only showing the stripped stars not showing the BE stars, but showing the known strip companions um, that are in binary systems with BE stars, together with evolutionary tracks for a system that undergoes mass transfer. So there's basically five, four, four tracks um, for different initial masses, only showing the star that is stripped, that, and I can use this, that, um, starts its evolution here, undergoes the main sequence evolution. And then after the end of the main sequence, there's a phase of mass transfer during which the envelope of the star is stripped. And then the leftover core is contracting. And in this phase, which is, as you can see here, I should probably put a non-logarithmic uh, axis here, um, is a very hot and then compact object. No, it's, sorry, it's not a compact object. It's a star that is compact with a much, much smaller radius than uh, you would have for a not stripped star. Um, and these are the cold, so-called subdwarf stars. So they have temperatures around 50, 60,000 Kelvin, and are usually detected as in this study in the UV. Okay, so this is the sample of more or less recently from 2020 that we knew of these stars. And most of these are bright BE stars for which um, UV observations were available. Another group of BE stars in a binary that we know and that are more or less well studied are B X-ray binaries, which are systems in which there is a BE star in the compact object, and the compact object basically plunges periodically through the disk of the BE star and produces X-rays. Those are usually detected in X-rays, so we detect them with different um, techniques, and there's a large catalog um, of these BE X-ray binaries, not only in the galaxy, but also in other, in the SMC and in the LMC. So those we know pretty well. And then there was one peculiar system, which is called MWC656, which for a long time was thought to be 
such a system, but in an X-ray quiet version where you have a compact object and a BE star, but probably given the orbital configuration, at least that was the idea, you don't get the X-rays from the system, but it still was proposed to be very similar to be an X-ray quiet BE binary with a black hole companion. Actually, recent work first as a conference proceeding and then actually as a letter to the editor has proposed that, well, that's a, the first black hole I'm going to mention. That's probably not one, that actually there is probably no black hole in the system. So this is not an X-ray quiet BE binary with a black hole companion, but actually one of the ones that we have on this side. So probably a BE plus subdwarf system in which the mass was overestimated and it's not a compact object there, but um, another BE plus subdwarf system. So now I put a question mark there. So far, we don't know of any X-ray quiet BE plus black hole binary, but they should exist. They're probably hard to observe. I mentioned before that some of those, depending on if there was a supernova should be disrupted. And actually there was a study that targeted exactly that checking how many BE stars are runaways and if their properties match what you would expect if you assume certain binary interactions and then supernova physics. And this study found that this actually agrees with the binary channel and that there is a large fraction of BE stars um, that are runaways. And now <laughs> I want to come to the systems that Lee mentioned before. Uh, they were recently found. I put them here because probably they're also BE plus stripped star systems. And I want to walk you through what they actually were, because as Lisa before, they were previously proposed to be very massive or not that massive, one of them, um, systems with a black hole. So that they got a lot of attention. So the two stars I want to mention here, first of all, LB1. It was actually quite a lot in the news because initially it was proposed to contain a B-type star and a 70 solar mass black hole. So that came to the news because the 70 solar mass black hole is in the mass gap. It's quite massive. Um, and it basically didn't work out with any black hole formation theories we had. So a lot of people jumped on it to see if they can change the, the black hole formation channels they have and to see whether actually we trust the observations that predicted or that found that there is a 70 solar mass black hole. The second one I wanted to show was also in the news. Um, not that much later, because it was proposed to be the closest black hole that was ever um, discovered. So first of all, we have an impossibly massive one, and then we have the closest one to Earth. And this one, HS6819, was initially proposed to be a triple system. So I mentioned triples before, where you have a B star and a black hole, and then a triple star, which is the third star in the system that is further out, which is a BE star. Again, made it to the news because it's so close to Earth that you can see it with your bare eyes in the Southern Hemisphere. And if there was a black hole, that would mean that there should be many more black holes than we actually thought in our galaxy. Because if you find one that is so close by, then statistically, there should be a lot out there. So what was actually the signature that led, and I'm going to focus on HI6819 here because we have the better observations because it's a brighter star. So basically, observationally, what uh, this system looked like, so now I'm going to show you more spectra again, is that um, the spectra, just to mention, I just shifted in flux to show, um, yeah, just to, to show all of them at the same time. And you can see that there's two components in the spectrum. One of them is this emission line that I said before is very typical for BE stars that is double peaked, probably coming from a disk that is rotating. And there is a second signature, which you see is moving. And these lines are typical for a normal B-type star. So what you have in here and what led to this initial interpretation of the system is a B-type star that is orbiting uh, with a, I think, roughly 50-day period around something. And you have an object that seems to be stable, so not the binary companion of this B-type star, because you don't see the movement easily, and you can work out if this had a given mass of a B-type star and the BE star has a usual mass and it doesn't match. So the idea was the B star moves around something we do not see. So we don't see it. Well, it could be a black hole. And the BE star is the third star in the system that is not related, which then explains why on observations of timescales of maybe a few years, we do not see any orbital motion. 
The second idea what this could be actually is, what if we get the mass of the B-type star wrong? So I said before, we see the B star is moving a lot, which implies a given mass of the object, it is moving around. So if this star, the B star, is actually much lighter than a normal B-type star, then it explains why we barely see any movement of the second star. So that's two ideas. One of them has the closest black hole to Earth. The other one would say, well, there is a stripped star that looks like a B star, which is really not what I explained before, that there is these stripped stars that are very hot. You don't see them in the optical. Um, so both of them quite surprising. But luckily, this system is close enough to actually test this. So the difference in these two scenarios is in both of them, we have two luminous stars. But the difference is that their separation on the sky. So in one of them, they are bound in a 40, 50 day period binary in the bottom one, which more or less translates to a separation on the sky of more or less one milli arc second. In the first scenario, you have this 48 day period for the BE and the black hole system. And then the BE star is on a much wider orbit of maybe 10, 20, 30 years, which translates into a separ separation on the sky of around 100 milli arc seconds. So this is easily testable. And we got some interferometry data using the VLTI uh, gravity to test this. So we took by now more, but back then two epochs of the system, and we found that actually there's two luminous sources and the separation on the sky is one milli arc second. Not a hundred, not what was predicted if there was a black hole in the system. And actually they do follow an orbit and you see, you can see the fit there that matches the 48 day or 40-ish day period that we found in the spectrum. Okay, so this tells us actually the B and the BE star are in a binary system here. There is no unseen object and there is no black hole in the system. So we also don't have to change our number counting of black holes that we expect in the galaxy. But of course, it means something else. It means that there is a B-type star in the system that looks like a B star. It has the lines, the spectral lines that are typical for a B star, but its mass must be below one solar mass. And if you think back, I said before, typical masses of these massive B stars are maybe eight, 10 solar masses. So this is really in contrast with each other, but you can solve it or you can explain it by saying, well, this is a most uh, post mass transfer system. So this is again, an evolutionary track only for the stripped star. It's very similar to what I've shown before. And it go, again, it shows how such a system could have evolved. So basically it starts with a star. I think we started with a six solar mass star here that evolves during the main sequence. At some point, because it has a binary companion, it starts rush lobe, rush lobe overflow, so mass transfer. At some point it stops. So the most of the envelope of this system has been taken away, was created by the companion, and then it will contract and heat up because of the contraction until it becomes a subdwarf. And as I said before, most systems were so far detected in this phase where it's like 40, 50,000 Kelvin hot. But what we think is that the system HR6819, and actually the same applies to LB1, was observed in this phase. So these are the observations. So this is basically just after the mass transfer ended in a phase where the star has not contracted yet, is not yet as hot as we know for these subdwarfs, and therefore looks like a normal B-type star, but has less than one solar mass. And for HR6819, actually using the spectroscopy and the interferometry, we can show that both the mass matches and also the temperatures, the surface gravities and everything. So we have a consistent picture for the system and we can actually learn something about the mass transfer because now we have a model and we can see what do we need to model this system with in terms of mass transfer physics in order to explain the observations that we have. And for this particular system, we found that you need a really short initial period and you need mostly conservative mass transfer, transfer to end up with the configuration that we have today. Of course, this is just one system, but it shows what the potential of these kind of binaries are. Now, if we go back to the figure I've shown you before, which is the one where we showed the, the subdwarf companions, we can now put HI6A19 and LB1 on here too. So basically, as I said before, this is a consistent picture where we think 
we observed them just in an earlier evolutionary phase, just after the mass transfer. And I just wanted to mention that after that, there was quite a lot of other systems that were either proposed to be similar to this or also to contain black holes. Quite a lot of them are still debated and putting them on here anyways, just to show you. And I also wanted to mention that some of them do not have BE companions, but B companions. So some of them have companions that do not show these emission lines, but again, the BE phenomenon is transient. So that might be one of the explanations for that. So if I just add more systems, um, basically they were detected in the last, what, three years? Um, we found more massive ones too. So we're, we're filling up this figure with systems that could be these post-interaction systems just after the mass transfer ended. And if we get more and more and more of them, we can learn more about the interaction physics. So now this also explains why they look like B-type stars in the phase we observe them, because while they sit more or less in the part that the evolutionary tracks for single stars on the main sequence also occupy, so you could easily mistake them for B-type stars, which means probably a lot of the other systems we know where we think there's a B star in a binary could be these kind of systems. And that probably means if we specifically look for them, and one particular thing we notice is that they're very slowly rotating, the stripped stars, not the BE stars, and we could find more of them, and then we can constrain more things about the interaction physics. So this is the last part of the argument, where basically a lot of the BE stars that we know have SDO companions, have compact companions, or are runaways, which is exactly the prediction of the binary channel. So, as I said before, there's three arguments. We have detected a lot of unevolved BE stars. There's an apparent lack of BE stars with main sequence companions. And a lot of BE stars have strip companions or compact companions. So basically, it seems like the binary channel forms a lot of them, which is cool because it means that they should have companions that are strip stars or compact objects, which are really interesting. So if we look for them, we can look next to BE stars to find them. And we can use them to test binary interaction physics, which, as I said, we've done for one of the systems, but it's only one. And I think I have like five more minutes because then I can say a big but. So while this, oh, I can't go back. Okay. So yeah, but this basically looks like the binary, a binary channel for BE stars is very important. There's a lot of observational evidence to this. But, well, now we can maybe turn the question around a little bit and say, are all of the BE stars binary interaction products? Or can we find systems in which we think the BE stars come from the single star channel to test if that one is actually working and if it's viable? And again, I'm mostly focusing on the massive BE stars. So one idea how to get such a system is again going to triples. There was one system that was predicted or, or found to be a system like this, where you have a binary system of two main sequence stars and a BE star that this time really is the outer third companion, which is resolved with interferometry, where you can basically use your two main sequence stars as a reference clock. And then you have a BE star, unless it was previously a quadruple system. You can check whether this one is actually at the end of its main sequence evolution, and it probably evolved as a single star. And one such example was is called New Gem. It was proposed to be basically the bona fide example of a BE star that formed as a single star to show that the single star channel and this internal um, evolution of stars actually works to make rapid rotators. And I just want to mention some ongoing work. I don't know why this one is there again. Now you see the result already. Ignore the right panel for now. I just wanted to mention a similar star. Um, that first we thought was very similar to this. A massive BE star that is in a triple system that evolved as a single star. So the, the uh, observational uh, evidence we have for this system is first of all, we have spectra and we see that there, you can see it here. We have spectra that are show a signature that we call SB2. So spectra, uh, double line spectroscopic binary where you see two components that over time move back and forth. So you have an indication that there are um, two main sequence stars in the system. And what we also have is a light curve that shows eclipses that matches the period of what we find with spectroscopy 
for these two stars, which is roughly 18 days. So we have from the spectrum and the light curve that there is an, a binary system with two massive stars, an O9 and a V0 star that are on an 18 day period. But as you can see already here, we also have an emission line. And this is just showing a difference. So this is H alpha, this is just one uh, iron emission line. So we have a lot of spectra for this system over a long period of time. And we can see that this H alpha emission line does not move on the 18 day period. So if we look during the 18 day period, the H alpha line basically doesn't move at all. If we look five years later, we see it moves. And we actually covered the entire orbit and we found that the H alpha line moves on a 900 day period, more or less. Which means probably we have something, like I said before, a massive binary that we can use as a reference clock and a massive BE star that is the triple system. Nice. So we can use this to test if this star really evolved as a single star. Um, so we asked for additional observations to really be sure. Interferometry again comes to the rescue because we can actually measure the distance between these stars. And ta-da, interferometry showed what we expected, that there is an unresolved binary that doesn't show emission, which is the O9 and V0 star, and there is a BE star that is at a distance that matches with the 900 day period. Nice. What we also found is that there's a fourth source in the system, which is much fainter. We are not sure yet if it is really bound, but at least it is there. So every time we look at the system, we find something else and it becomes more complicated. And we also found it has a bow shock, which usually is indicative of a high space velocity, unless the ISM is in that region moving with a high velocity. And it's probably associated to the Carina region, which is a star forming region. So for now, this is only very preliminary. But as I said, we should be able to use this binary system if it's pre interaction as a reference clock, and then see if the BE star we see it's is actually at the main uh, at the end of its main sequence evolution. But what we found so far, it does it doesn't match. Basically, it doesn't work out age age wise of the the different components that are in the system, such that either we're getting something wrong about the uh, inner binary or that the E star is not at the end of its main sequence evolution, but actually more uh, older than it should be. So it's a tricky system. It could mean that there was interaction before and it was actually quadruple, but basically our idea of simply testing whether the single star channel worked made everything way more complicated. Um, so I wanna leave you with this. We think that a lot of the BE stars come from, from binary interactions, which is cool because again, we can find companions next to them and we can constrain interaction physics, which are largely unconstrained. But there are many open questions shown by these triple systems that are highly debated, but also about these all these other questions that I mentioned in the beginning that we're not really sure about. And yeah, I think I'm gonna leave you with this and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, Julia, for that uh, fantastic talk. So if anyone has any questions here in the room, we'll, 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 we'll go there first, and then we'll take some questions on Zoom. So if you'd like to raise your hand on Zoom, and I can see the Zoom, so I can, I can get through that as well. But we'll start in the room, and we'll start with, with, with Miriam. Hi, Julia. Thank you very much. I was just wondering, how could you form this star in the interaction scenario? Like, you mean the in the binary? Yeah. Yeah. Who 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 would be the the mass donor for the B star? Yeah, you would probably not see the mass donor. So if this was the case, then well, we we're pretty sure that the binary system is pre-interaction. So you would might have another object that you do not see in the system that could be a compact object that was previously the companion of the BE star, which would then make this a quintuple. <laughs> and also I didn't mention, but already there's a lot of mass in the system. So it would add up to the entire, to the total mass of the system. And then of course, question is how this formed in the first place. 
that, yeah, so since I've read a couple of proposals, there's this also this crazy lead of Kusai uh, interactions. So would that have anything to do, or you don't think this interacted with the inner system? It could definitely. There was actually, I think, two weeks ago, I think there was a paper that said that these effects could be very important for BE stars in triple systems. Um, yeah, probably could have. I think we tested that right now, the, it should be stable given the periods it has right now. Um, but yeah, could definitely have played a role if, if 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 it was really such, because then it would be a very complicated system. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll go for one. Uh, really nice talk, Julia. I had a question on your distribution of the new detected B stars compare in the in this HR or you color diagram in the blue, that one, yeah. Uh, this when, one. when you have all those these. So what is the timeline in terms of how fast does it cross through that evolutionary track on, on, in other words, is the amount of stars you see at that evolutionary phase consistent yeah. with the ones you see on the other one? And the second one is to detect these things in the UV, you need the two stars to be sort of different, one cool and one hot in the, uh, so, what are the chances that your distribution of, uh, in terms of masses and uh, SEDs could be just a selection effect as yeah. well? Yeah. Okay, so first question first. Um, I guess it depends a lot on what you assume for your evolution, basically. I have to say there's two, so this is a different one, but there's two papers that basically came out on the same day, one day after the other. Uh, independently, one of, that we did in Leuven together, and one by Karim El Badri, and we found very similar things for this evolutionary timescale. And I think our estimate was based on the star of the evolution of the companion, because your BE star will evolve as well. This amounts to roughly ten percent of the lifetime of the system, so it's not that terribly short. Because that was the first thing we thought as well: what if this is a really short phase? How likely are we to observe it? But I think the number we got was roughly 10% of the lifetime until the BE star hits the end of its main, se main sequence evolution. Of course, it's model dependent. But the other thing that helps is that usually we observe in the optical. And these systems that I mentioned here are roughly similar brightness in the optical because your star has not contracted yet. So it's a big selection effect to detect those with, with the usual means that we use because you see both of them contributing similarly. And then, of course, your second question, yes, there's a big bias. The most of these systems were found in uh, archival IUE spectra, in which they also used radial velocity information. So they do detect the signatures of both stars, because well, BE stars are not that hot, but they are hot. But usually they, they, they detect the signatures of both, but using um, a CCF, so checking the radial velocities, they can distinguish between the two and at least show that there is a companion. Uh, I think for most of those, by now, there's an orbit as well. And some of these are detected not only in IUE, but also in the optical, because in some of these cases, you see the effect of the companion on the BE star disk. Because one of the ideas that if you have a companion, you change the density structure in the disk, and you can see that in the optical observations. But yes, surely it's heavily observationally biased. Okay, so we have, well, we had questions on Zoom and then hands raised and then they appear to have been put down. But there is a question on the chat, so I might read that out if that's okay with you, Julia. Of course. Okay, so is there a good understanding of how close to critical would be the mass gainer after the end of mass transfer? Um, I am not really an expert on that, so I'm repeating what I've heard from the theorists, and I think... It depends a lot on what you assume, but I also think most of the assumptions are they actually really, so basically they, they stop the mass transfer in the models because the stars reach critical very fast. And then depending on which code and which assumptions you use, there's different assumptions on what happens with the excess material. But usually I think the stars are assumed to be very close to critical, but observationally it's really hard to find that. And it's also a question how fast they spin down after the mass transfer stops. Okay, thank you very much. And that was a question from Ken Ken Gailey, who had to had to leave the Zoom. So, is there is there any more questions in the room? So we'll we'll, we'll come back to the room for a second. Thomas, 
I guess I could ask a question. Uh, very nice talk, by the way. Um, so what, I guess one of the challenges that I don't remember who pointed it out first, uh, that kind of challenges this uh, binary evolution versus single star evolution scenario is what if uh, stars in binaries, in close binaries, tend to not rotate rapidly when they're born, but stars when they're born as single stars because of angular momentum considerations do rotate, tend to rotate rapidly. Yeah. How would you tackle this challenge in terms of discerning whether or not, uh, yeah. I think it's a very tricky one. So one of the observations that comes to my mind is looking at really young clusters and checking how fast they actually rotate. If you look at stars where you think that just after um, formation, which is also tricky. And again, it's tricky to measure rotational velocities if it's that close to critical. But I think that would be one of the ideas. So go to a cluster that is really young and try to measure the V sine i's and compare the, the, the stars you think are single and the binary stars. But then there's also people, and I'm thinking of Chen Wang's work here, that think that some of these slowly rotating stars were actually before the main sequence began. They were binary systems that merged. So that, of course, complicates the whole picture. But maybe that would be an idea to go there. But I think I mentioned it before, actually, if you look at really young clusters, there are not many BE stars in the first place. So that's also an observation that, that helps with that. Okay, so are, are there any more questions on, on, on Zoom? Remember, you can raise your hand and ask the question yourself on Zoom, or I can read it out from the, from the chat. Uh, there, there does appear to be one more question in the chat. And I will read that out. Uh, are there any binaries in the unevolved B stars? You mean, okay, I'm not sure I understand the question. The question is, are there any binaries in the unevolved BE stars? That is so the that question. would be, I, I hope I get the question correctly. So I think this targets, I have to go back a bit. I think this is with respect to the unevolved BE stars that we see in clusters. Um, I think, I hope I'm getting this correctly. And I think the question is, do we see any binaries here, which should be post-interaction binaries then, because we think those came from the binary channel. Unfortunately, the answer is, I don't know. It's, I know that in this cluster, not. So for this one, we have the Muse observations. We only have six epochs, so we cannot, our binary detection is not as easy because we only have six epochs. But I can say that among the BE stars in this cluster, we only find one binary that is close to the turnoff. Um, but again, observationally very tricky and the signal to noise is not great and only very few epochs. But it's definitely something to, to specifically target because yeah, the predictions are very clear. Those should have either been uh, split up or they should have companions that are strip stars or compact objects. Yes, okay. I hope that was the answer to the question. Well, I hope it was as well. And, and, and Ranjan, if, you, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question or, or tell us whether or not we, we, we have answered it or Julia has answered uh, it. Obviously. Yes, uh, but, uh, can you hear me? But yeah. It does look like yeah, you are. So, so, so if you'd like to go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, thanks, Julia. Uh, I um, hopefully um, the answer is uh, I'm, what I could Doesn't understood is that seem like we can is... hear you in the room, Ranjan. So that is okay. That is, okay. I'll, I'm I'll sorry I'll about text. that, but yeah. Okay. So if we have any final questions, we've probably got time for a t extremely quick question. Uh, or, or if not, let's thank Julia again. And thank you all for coming. And th th thanks everyone on Zoom as well. And you're getting rounds of applause on Zoom, Julia. So yeah, that's great.